In chapter 11, we have one of the strangest things that happens in, in the book of Genesis. We have an, an act of pride, an act of self-exaltation on the part of man in, in building uh, a tower. Um, <clears throat> and the, the tower, which is built in the land of Shinar, verse 2, is, is a cooperative task which evidently has something to do with religion, which evidently has something to do with an approach to God. Look at Genesis 11, verse 4, where people say to each other, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the whole earth. And in verse 6, we see again a consultation of God which leads to judgment, which leads to the confusion of languages. God says, come let us go down, verse 7, come let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. This is a kind of judgment for united action taken independent of God and taken in a way in defiance of God. Now, when we were studying Genesis 1 and 2, I told you that we receive a, a challenge about the age of the earth, not only from cosmology, and not which has to do with the stars, and not only with biology, which has to do with animal and human reproduction, but also from anthropology which has to do with the way mankind has developed, especially with reference to racial distinctions and linguistic distinctions. And anthropologists tell us that for, that to have the racial characteristics that we have and to have the linguistic characteristics that we have, it takes tens of thousands of years at least 100,000 years. Well, I want to say that maybe that's right. And maybe what that means is that we have to uh, account for gaps in the genealogies and the other ways that we make the references to time elastic. Maybe the truth is that human life is, is at least 100,000 years old based on anthropology, whereas biologists would tell us that human life is much older than that. Well, let me remind you that I'm not an anthropologist, <laughs> and I'm not sure how these conclusions are drawn about the racial and the linguistic distinctions. But I want to remind you that the biblical revelation is not an exhaustive revelation. We learned that from John 21, again, when, when John says, we're not telling you everything that Jesus did. Well, I think Moses would say the same thing. We're not telling you every detail of what God did. I think it's very possible that the division of languages in chapter 11 and the judgment on the, the races through the sons of Noah in chapters in chapter 9 could accelerate the the racial distinctives just as the division of languages was accelerated in other words the judgment at the tower of babel could have had implications beyond linguistic implications there could have been other anthropological consequences of the judgment in the Tower of Babel. And those other consequences could have accelerated the divisions that normally would have taken a long time. Remember, this is a supernatural judgment. This is not happening naturally. And remember I told you that there were at least four events in Genesis 1 through 11, which means that we cannot measure time the way we could have if we did not have those events in Genesis 1 through 11. The events are the creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel judgment. 
Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 3, Genesis 7 through 9, and Genesis 11. So I'm not proving anything. I'm not insisting on anything. I'm just telling you that if the Bible is true, and we believe that it is true, that we cannot use naturalistic diagnostic procedures. We cannot measure as if God was not supernaturally active in creation and in judgment. And we're not told all the consequences of the creation and judgment. So my dear friends, let me put it this way. Never make the Bible the handmaiden of science. Never make the Bible serve science. Let God be God and know that He's the Creator. And let science serve God. We were given capacities to be scientists and to make discoveries by God because we're made in His image and we're placed on a planet in the solar system and in the galaxy which lends itself to discovery. But let's use those discoveries to honor God and to worship God and to believe God, not to dishonor God. Now, it's an amazing thing, this confusion of languages. I wish it didn't happen because if it hadn't happened, then everybody would think I was smart because I go to all these countries and if we all spoke the same languages, people would say, he's really smart. Well, maybe they would say that. I don't know. But now I go to all these countries and they say, you've lived in Germany. Can you speak German? No. You lived in Russia. Can you speak Russian? No. You live in Hungary. Can you speak Hungarian? No. I only speak English. I can order a meal in Germany. I can ask which way to the train station in Germany but I can't preach a sermon in German. So, um, there's been this marvelous division of languages. Now, let me just say this. Pentecost was a blessing that began to restore the possibility of communication. The opposite of the Tower of Babel judgment was the speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost. So there is in the Old Testament in Genesis 11 a supernatural judgment of confusion and there is in the New Testament in Acts 2 a supernatural blessing of understanding. I've never spoken in tongues. I've never been present where someone speaks in tongues in such a way that someone else can understand. Obviously, we have Christians who make claims that that's still happening today. I don't know if it's happening today or not. I've never seen it happen. But I know that it happened on one day. I know that it happened in Acts chapter 2. And a person who studies other languages and learns other languages like you have studied and are learning um, is making an opportunity to reverse this judgment by telling more than one language group the good news of the gospel, or by learning about God by studying language from languages other than your mother tongue. But this is a judgment not to understand. And let me just say that even, even when we do speak the same language, it's hard to understand one another. But let me say that one of the worst wars that we've ever fought were wars with one another wars between the North and the South, wars between people who spoke the same language, between people who understood each other. So even if we learn the same language, only the Holy Spirit can bring understanding. Only the Holy Spirit can bring peace. Only the, understand the Holy Spirit can bring unity, and that's a blessing. But there was a judgment brought in Genesis 11. At the end of Genesis 11, we see a new name in Scripture. Genesis 11, 26. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Abram. Now we're going to see a great change. Remember I told you that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are about events. 
the remaining chapters of Genesis are about people, personalities. The remaining chapters in Genesis, Genesis 12 through 20, are about a family. As a matter of fact, the rest of the whole Bible is about one man's family. A man who is first named in chapter 11, verse 26, and a man whose story we take up in chapter 12. A man who lived in a city um, called Ur of the Chaldees, a man called Abram, present-day Iraq. Verse 29 said that uh, Abram and Nahor, his brother, took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Sarah was barren. She couldn't have, Sarai was barren. She couldn't have any children. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot, Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. They went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. In the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, before chapter 7, the average age of the patriarch, patriarchs was 912 years before the flood. After the flood, this man lives to be very, 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 very old. And no one would live this long today. But compared to the age of the, those who lived before the flood, he didn't live very long. He lived 205 years. Genesis 11:31 is a summary. This is what happened. This old man, this old father, went with his children out of his hometown in Iraq, and they went west. But they stopped in Haran, where Terah died. Terah died. Okay. Now we're going to see how it happened. Why did they leave? For what reason? What did it mean? We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com.